too much of a burden. Peter Rose has been bringing all the uh, supplies for coffee, so there is coffee in the back. So you know, when you contribute, we provide things of that nature. So um, that's really very important. Uh, a couple announcements uh, for those of you who are thinking of being precinct chairs. Now is the time to get your applications in because that has to be done by mid-December. And it's really important because as we move forward and have endorsements and things coming up for the primary, it's very important that we have as many precinct chairs and many precincts covered as possible. I have recently moved to Sims Township, which is a far piece away from here. I still own my property right here in Mount, uh, Auburn, though. And so I'm going to be a precinct chair in Sycamore F. I got my paperwork in already because I realized that out in that area, we need to have a lot of work done for District 1. And if you believe, if you gerrymandering, oh my goodness, you could see this <laughs> teeny, teeny little finger that's up in the middle of nowhere that is District 1. Everything else around us is District 2. It's crazy. And so it's just absolutely crazy. And so as we're trying to, you know, figure out who's running in District 1, who's running in District 2, and how we organize this and that. It is the craziest thing to try and figure out that the people right across the street from you are in District 2. It's, it's, it's really crazy. So that gerrymandering affects all of us, very definitely. But, uh, you know, I'm almost up there in Warren County, and we're getting organized up in that area, so I think that's an area that I needed to show focus. Obviously, I'll still be down here in the city just because this is where I am. Uh, are there any announcements? Alrighty. I guess I have one. Okay. I got you. Oh, God. Yeah. I got a loud, I have a loud voice. Oh, uh, you need the Hello, everyone. It's my first time here. Thank you. <laughs> Where are we? I don't know. Keep pushing it. There, there we go. It went on. Hello, everyone. Hold it close. Hello, everyone. This is my first time here. About five hours. your name? I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm Penny Ann or Penny. I answered it either one. It doesn't matter. Um, your last name is? Okay. Is it's it's Frepon or Frepin. That's the N size. It's French. Hard to pronounce sometimes for some people. I answer anything. I brought flyers uh, from a meeting I attended at the Women's Network for Democratic Principles in Northern Kentucky. That's where I'm from all my life. And uh, I had 50 copies made of that information. And some are down here. It concerns the Ohio River. It's really important. Thanks to Mike, who was my teacher in Lolly Place. He said I could bring them. So it's by Mike and me. Except it is not like it, but they're back here. And it, I think you'll find it interesting. Thank you. It's, it's the information from the Sierra Club about some of the fracking. Yeah, it's the information from the Sierra Club. We had a speaker there, and uh, they, it's remarkable what will happen and is going on. It's already been approved in Pennsylvania. The EPA is no help. None. No. None. And, uh, right. and um, it concerns eight states. So we're right concerns eight states. And we're one of them. The Ohio River is the dirtiest river in the United States. It has the most varied species of fish and the highest number of paddlers on it. We enjoy it. We want to keep it as clean as we can. Uh, sorry I didn't get back to you last week as, as I had promised. Uh, today I have both the table of issues, and I have one that I did not mention, and it's specifically on money and politics, and I also, so everybody, those will be passed around. There are buttons for anybody who is I going to wear it. For you. Okay. Like it no charge bring up this. the program. Now, the one thing that I want to say is that when Obama joined the rank of those who say, push too hard and you lose. That is a question of what your belief is, what you're willing to invest your faith in. And if we give up, if we believe what they're saying on MSNBC, on, on uh, CNN, and the major politicians, we're not going to be able to change the world about any of the things that we know have to be done. So I hope you will, no matter what your heartfelt issue is, I hope you'll keep in mind that if we don't get this basic point of view, if we don't start to reframe it, we're not getting anywhere. Thank you. Uh, 
Saturday night at uh, St. Monica, 2,000 cities across the country are going to be making a uh, stand against the death penalty. Uh, put flyers back there. I'd like to join that. Uh, some of you, some of you who are new may not know that uh, we have cater. Uh, there's pizza and salad back there, and this is from Sister Judy, who employs people when they come out of prison, helping them to get you know job experiences and whatever. So you might think about uh, patronizing them. It's ten bucks. Sometimes we have sandwiches and sometimes we have pizza. Venice on vine. Venice on vine. And also, uh, there's stand-made copies of uh, Tracy Hunter's uh, talk when she got out of jail. They're back there if you'd like to have one. Uh, help yourself. Hi, my um, ballot access petitions to have Buttigieg on the spring presidential primary ballot is going out today. And I still, yeah, and I still have 10 spaces that can be filled in. So I know a lot of you have already signed, but if not and you're interested, uh, please give me a shout. I can bring it over to you. You can stop by my table here, and I'll get that signed off and ready to go. Thank you. Uh, David? For you. That's a good question. <laughs> Marlena Brookfield, not running for CPS board right now. <laughs> right now. Maybe next time. Maybe. 2021. Uh, and if you hadn't heard about uh, City Council's proposal of adding about 15 new TIF districts in the city of Cincinnati, that is the next big tax issue that is going to take funding away from our schools. And instead of uh, renegotiating the 99 agreement, this is their plan. So I'm trying to get people organized to be in front of the school board and city council as often as we can before December 18th to let them know these TIF districts are not going to work. And if you really, really care about our schools and our schools and city growing together, you need to get on this. So thank you. Okay, Marlene, can you explain what the TIF is? What is, what is the purpose of that? What, what is it about? Yeah. So, so TIF stands for Tax Increment Financing. And let me try and think of the most clear way to describe it. Um, so if you, if you have an area designated as a TIF district, um, any new tax revenue that comes from improvements or whatever, that goes into, as of right now, a general fund for the city. And they can allocate it however they want. It does not go to schools or libraries or any of these levies that we keep passing. And so what's going to happen is they're going to have to keep coming back to us voters to make up the difference. And that we just can't have that. It's a slap in the face to, like Carolyn Jones said, it's a slap in the face to anyone who voted for these tax levies. And then they're going to have to come back to us again for new money because they don't have enough. We need to get in front of them for it. Uh, to add a little bit more onto the TIF districts, uh, It'd be a different story if in these 15 TIF districts there was a specific amount of money set aside or a specific amount of land that was put aside for affordable housing. According to the TIF law in Ohio, that cannot be used for any kind of TIF financing. So in other words, the whole point of bringing people back into the city, it's it's a way to push people out of the city and only provide places for wealthy white people to move into our city. We have lost a tremendous amount of middle class African American families who have moved out because they wanted their kids to be in a more diverse neighborhood, a nurse, more diverse school, that they have kids that are from all different countries and colors and nationalities and so they're moving out because there's not affordable housing here in Cincinnati. These TIF districts are just going to make it ten times worse. 
So speak up, folks. TIF districts are not in our best interest. Um, I want to add to that also. Uh, the school board took the unusual step of going to city, the, the last city council meeting, and um, publicly embarrassing them by showing up and strongly uh, stating that they are not going to accept the current status, which is proposing the new TIF districts and not negotiating in good faith about tax abatements in the future. So right now is a key time because that 20 year tax abatement agreement ends this year. And um, also there's people on council who don't want to have to deal with uh, uh, being accused of not supporting the schools. So because especially Christopher Smitter Smitterman, he wants to run for mayor and he was, he, you know, you could tell the ones that were disturbed and felt threatened by the school board's action to actually show up at their meeting. So I think if we show up at the school board meetings and encourage them to continue in that vein, to make demands, not to accept, um, you know, concessions, and, and then go to city council and tell them we're watching, very closely, and that this is a priority, it will make a difference. More announcements? Well, I'm just going to grab Susan while she's grabbing pizza. Uh, we had talked about getting a group together to go down to the Hamilton County Courthouse to observe the judges. Are, would you care to? Are we still doing that? or? I'm not, but I think there was some other people. Okay, Carol. Yeah, I sent, the League of Women Voters is doing a training, and I just sent our names in, uh, a couple of us. If anybody else wants to go, they can tell me, or give me your email, and I'll email you when the training is. Because um, they train you first, and then you go. So Sue and I, and Ann Froelich are on the list. Can you, so, uh, I'm Carol. Email, email, email okay. About that. okay. Uh, just to make sure anybody who, who wants to know about this, uh, before the election, we had all the judicial candidates come out here and speak to us. And we were strongly encouraged, especially by Erica Underwood, to be courtroom observers. Because some of these judges that are just evil from the bench, evil to any poor or black and brown person coming in, they need to be watched. And they have, they have already said, I don't like it when they're in my courtroom. I can't do what I want to do. <laughs> and so, I mean, there was somebody by the name of Heather, Heather Russell out in my area who got elected. She's been there for 30 years, and she's going to do whatever she damn well wants to do. Mm -hmm. And she is the one that basically says, I know you have a right to a jury trial, but if you're going to waste my time in the jury trial, you're going to get a maximum sentence if I find you guilty. She also has the highest <coughs> cash bonds out there. But not if you're walking and you're white. You're going to get a low cash bond or no bond. But if you're black or brown or poor, she's an absolute racist and she's on the bench. And there's quite a few others like her. Erica tells you that um, you will see those judges who don't want to work for the people. They want to have them plead guilty and get them through as fast as they can because that's efficient for their courts. Well, you ought to look underneath their robes. They got their golf shoes on. They've got a tea time at one o'clock. Mm -hmm. They're not interested in spending the time like they should. And so we have a huge group of, what is it, 15 new judicial candidates that will be running in the primary in the spring. And so I'm really excited about this group of folks out there. Carrie Bloom is running again, and quite a, other, uh, a few other people. So it's really important that we become observers of what they are doing because our court system in Hamilton County has had a Republican thumb on it for a really long time and we need to break out. All right, Peter, Peter you ready? Oh. And our very own okay. Peter Rose. All right. The nature of capitalism and <laughs> socialism. 
Now, Peter, I want to warn you. I haven't been in the classroom taking a major Ooh. social studies course for 50 years. I don't want it to go. I'm down in the weeds, so make sure that uh, I can understand. Everything is on the handout. My assumption is if any of you have insomnia, if you keep this next to you, it'll just all work out just fine. And I'm going to basically, this stuff may seem stupid, I'm just going to be reading what's on here because otherwise I might digress and it would take two hours. Did you get one of these? I did not. But I will come around and get Thank you. Capitalism and socialism. I, 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 I should say, if you, uh, if you look at my, my first uh, text, which I'm not going to read, you say this talk is actually inspired by, uh, by, by the, 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 the inquirer and the kind of stupid things it said about Trump is going to win because of socialists. Uh, that's why I focus exclusively on seeing this group as a room full of potential democratic canvassers. If this works. <laughs> this is I think you have to put it on its the regular. If you didn't have it on the what they call it, where it was actually going to be playing as a strip. Well, that one was good, too. <laughs> <laughs> if you're going to stay behind, they're just, just going to come here and just watch it. Huh? Keep going back to my house. I think he started off. It's a real nightmare. I thought it was going to show later. Oh, you're going to show right here? Soon to be a major motion picture, capitalism. <laughs> <laughs> Stanley, can you help him at all? What, what do we need? What is I don't know. I don't know. It's computer. Okay, let's. They probably. Stan is coming. Is there any reason that this isn't. Well, I don't know what. what somebody must have touched somebody. Uh, okay, I think it's fair to say that our educational system, especially our history courses <laughs> and our public media, do not encourage an analytical approach to capitalism, which is most often. Uh, taken for granted as the natural way things are. Beyond a few vague phrases like uh, free market system, most of us would be most of us would be hard pressed to explain the term capitalism to someone from a pre-capitalist society. Uh, can I get to see it? <laughs> Yet serious study, I think, of the dynamics of a pre-capitalist slave society 
could be very relevant for understanding uh, American history. But everyone from Donald Trump to Jason Williams to former judge Mark Painter is an expert on socialism. If you check out the text on uh, the text, I'm not going to read them, um, but there's a sort of the, the inquirer telling us that socialism is going to guarantee that Trump wins. And that's actually what inspired me to try to confront this, this issue. Um, but I think it's important to start with capitalism because socialism historically is a reaction to capitalism. Capitalism, the word, this is passage two. Capital long meant simply wealth, riches. The capitalist long meant uh, a rich man. But capitalism was a very recent coinage. Uh, there's a quote from uh, Baudel, who has three huge volumes on the origins of capitalism. Quote, in 1867, the word was still unknown to Marx, this word which Marx never used. I mean, that amazed me that <laughs> Marx never used the word capitalism. Well, he used das Kapital, right? Yeah, <laughs> he could have used capitalism if he knew English, right? That's true. <laughs> I can't even see my own text now. It's just, through, just look through Stan and you'll see. You want I'm your looking paper? through you and you're nowhere. <laughs> well, he's got large print on his. <laughs> I don't know how I slept last night at all. I mean, I thought, oh, this could be this hard. Imagine this happening in a classroom when all your technology goes down and this is what your lesson was about. I cannot tell you how many times that would happen. It happens. Uh -huh. It happens all the time. And some little kid can come up and fix it for you. It's just like you feel like you did it. Go out here and find my best story. And we'll get it up. get rid of James's PowerPoint. It keeps cropping up like that. Where's the sixth grade audiovisual club when you need it? That's right. <laughs> Just talk to us, Peter. Yeah. Well, well he, he lost his notes. Did he get the notes? Hmm? You have it on a thumb drive or anything? What? You have it on a thumb drive or anything like that? Yeah, I mean, this, this thing here is supposed to um, do it. It's plugged into my computer. I'm being such a patient. Not to worry. Yes. Martha, you want a microphone? I thought I had a very tight. Your diary today was a red letter. Day. Well, I, I have seldom spoken about this, but I mean, if they come to take me away at 82, I mean, so be it. But um, my son became a young communist years ago, gosh, 40, 50 years ago. And he said to me, Mom, I'm, I'm part of the Young Communist League. He was had joined in Washington, D.C., where he was living mostly. But he came home, he said, Mom, I've joined the Young Communist League. And listen, I want you to join the CP. He said, you are a communist. You don't know it, but you are. I said, well, no, I, don't. I think not. And so finally, <laughs> he said, there's a chapter here in town you could go to. <clears throat> so I went to see what they were talking about, what it was all about here. And I found out it was a terrifically good group. And I mean, they were important in a number of <coughs> movements here that nobody knew communists were involved. They would sit on the front row of somebody's speech and ask the right questions and all like that. And so I liked them. And um, I met with them quite, quite a few times. <clears throat> And a young student of mine, a black young black woman, she heard that I 
well, I don't know, maybe I talked with her about it. She came to one of our meetings and she, she wanted to join. I said, well, you have to think about it. And I said, why don't you go to this conference of the young communists that's going to happen in Cleveland and see what you think. And she did. And she wrote a nice long article about it openly. The communist, young communist, which I printed. We had a little magazine my husband and I were doing. We printed her article, Heading Out for the Young Communist League, I think was the name of it. So, I learned more. Oh, you ready to go? Well, look, I was doing well. Why? Come on. Next week. Okay, my, my point was that although we seem to know nothing about capitalism, there are lots of people like Donald Trump and Jason Williams and this former judge who think they know all about socialism. If you uh, Google search socialism, you get 60 pages which shows that it's meant very different things to different people at different times. But I think it's absolutely crucial to start with analyzing the specificity of capitalism because socialism historically is a reaction to capitalism. Okay, I went through this word. The preconditions of capitalism are spelled out in vast detail in Brunel's three, I'm sorry, Brunel's three large volumes, things like nutrition, population density, sources of energy, technology, artillery, printing, and especially seafaring, Columbus and all that, money, towns, big cities, markets, landless, former peasants. But its essential features were first theorized by Adam Smith in The Wealth of Nations, 1776. Well, uh, the dude. Nice hair. <laughs> The very first sentence, P3, and this is crucial, you need to memorize this sentence because the whole rest of my talk depends on it. The greatest improvement in the productive power of labor and the greater part of skill, dexterity, and judgment with which it is anywhere directed or applied seem to have been the effects of the division of labor, end quote. The modest example he offers is the manufacture of straight pins. One worker cuts the wire, a second sharpens one end, a third attaches the top. Voila, many more pins than produced by the single expert craftsman. Let's try to unpack some of the implications of this. The breaking down of the labor process through the maximum specialization of labor is then an essential feature of capitalism. It entails maximizing the output by minimizing dependence on the specialized skill of the producers. The judgment in the direction of skill uh, must come from the unnamed capitalist, the one who buys the raw material, hires the workers, directs their activities, and reaps the profits from selling the product of their labor. It also implies the end of the independent craftsman in charge of and understanding the whole process of producing the commodity. Smith was honest enough to spell out the human consequences of the very system that he was fostering. This is passage four. Quote, in the progress of the division of labor, the employment of the far greater part of those who live by labor, that is, the greater body of the people, comes to be confined to a few very simple operations. The man whose whole life is spent performing a few simple operations has no occasion to exert his understanding or to exercise his invention in finding out expedients for removing difficulties, which never occur. He naturally loses, therefore, the habit of such exertion and generally becomes as stupid and ignorant as it is possible for a human being to become." End quote. Thus, one great consequence of capitalism is the fostering of stupidity. The second consequence of Smith's analysis is a dramatic increase in production and thus a huge increase in the overall wealth of the capitalist nation. Smith's example still presupposes manufacture, that is making by hand, with a minimum of hand tools, even without specially designed machines or new sources of power. When to that process are added dramatic new sources of power, that is the steam engine of Watt was put into action the very same year as Smith's book, 1776, and ingenious new labor-saving machines, 
For example, Eli Whitney's Cotton Gin of 1793, the capitalist steamroller, so to speak, was on its way. Long before Marx's much maligned labor theory of value, Smith declared passage five, the value of any commodity to the person who possesses it and who means not to use or consume it himself, but to exchange it for other commodities is equal to the quantity of labor it enables him to purchase or command. Labor, therefore, is the real measure of the exchange value of all commodities, end quote. The person envisioned in this statement is no ordinary consumer, but one who buys commodities only to resell them. That is a capitalist. Earlier, Smith had expatiated on the great virtues of machines which lessen the necessary amount of human labor. Thus, one consequence of capitalism is a constant pressure to reduce the quantity of human labor in the cost of any particular commodity. In this sense, capitalism, on the one hand, liberates us from much tedious hard work. Just think of the centuries of back-breaking agriculture for the majority of humanity. Uh, here you see a sort of harvesting with scythes, but it turns out actually scythes uh, were a labor-saving device, an improvement over the sickle, where you have to be right down low at the level of the ground, and that was used for centuries to harvest grain. Today, thanks to labor-saving devices, only 2% of Americans engage in agriculture. This liberatory aspect of capitalism is, for Marx, one of its greatest contradictions. The dark side of the capitalist drive to Mike. minimize human labor in production Put is, the mic at your face. It's, I'm sorry, is the, is the creation of unemployment, both by offshoring to cheaper labor and the replacement of humans by machines, now especially by robots. I won't read that passage, but it's, it's striking figures. Initially, uh, it related to replacing grown men with women and children, uh, passage 7. This is mind-boggling to me. In 1813 to 14, out of 213,000 hand-loom weavers, 130,000, more than half, were under the age of 14, end quote. For adult males, the result was unemployment. So a major consequence of capitalism is unemployment. Leisure, instead of opening up the full development of every human being's potential, becomes a source of bitterness and self-hatred. The key consequence of the change in production celebrated by Smith is a level of overproduction unique to capitalism. Internationally, it requires access to and ideally control of foreign markets and raw materials. This in turn leads to imperialism and imperialistic wars. And it should check out the handouts, I won't read them, but it shows politicians around the turn of the century were much more honest, were much more honest about the underlying logic of imperialism, which is uh, over, over uh, production. Uh, the built-in necessity of capitalism's endless growth also imperils the planet through destruction of natural spaces, exploitation of limited resources, and massive pollution. Domestically, of course, overproduction has led to periodic depressions, boom and bust, and a vast expansion of mind-numbing advertising. Americans are encouraged to think of themselves not as active, participating citizens, but as passive consumers. Recall George Bush's exhortation after 9-11, go out and shop. <laughs> Passage 10, in the contemporary world where the mass media serve as increasingly powerful arbiters of reality, the primacy of style over substance has become the normative consciousness. Uh, and I find this a haunting image of the success of style over substance and the manipulation of human desires towards soul-destroying consumption. Adam Smith's quasi-religious doctrine of the invisible hand inscribed human self-interest as the essential key to a flourishing society, passage 11. By, quote, by pursuing his own interest, he frequently promotes that of society more effectively than when he intends to promote it. I've never known much good done by those who affected to trade for the public good, end quote. The last phrase bestows Smith's blessing on business people who pay absolutely no attention to the public good while scorning mere good intentions. It also fits in with his emphasis on minimal government interference with the economy, passage 12. Quote, nothing, however, 
can be more absurd than this whole doctrine of the balance of trade upon which not only these restraints but almost all other regulations of commerce are founded. But that trade which, without force or constraint, is naturally and regularly carried on between two places is always advantageous, though not always equally so to both. More generally, Smith's view tends to enforce the view that greed and self-interest are the dominant components of human nature and that free trade is inherently natural. But precisely because the exclusive goal of profit so often entails various forms of physical and mental pollution for society at large, and democratic regulations and taxation policies can cut into profits, capitalism, capitalists are obliged to engage in politics. I need not, for this audience, uh, rehearse the data of Jane Mayer's dark money or the arguments of Move to Amend or American Promise movements about the disastrously anti-democratic consequences of capitalist wealth invested in protecting capitalists from regulation and fair taxation. The notorious Lewis Powell memo of 1970 urging massive engagement in politics by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and shared with literally millions of business owners is quite explicit about the threat of regulation and taxation. For Powell, Ralph Nader was the embodiment of the drive for regulation. He quotes a, a Fortune magazine profile, passage 13. The passion that rules him is aimed at smashing utterly the target of his hatred, which is corporate power. He thinks that a great many corporate executives belong in prison, horrible thought, for defrauding the consumer with shoddy merchandise, poisoning the food supply with chemical additives, and willfully manufacturing unsafe products that maim and kill the buyer, end quote. Yeah. Powell's solution to this horror was massive corporate money in politics. And then we put them on the Supreme Court. Exactly. <laughs> Nixon, Nixon's service, yes. He was involved in Citizens United. Let me try to sum up what we have seen so far about capitalism. It degrades the worker, fostering stupidity, and wherever possible replaces the worker with a machine or a cheaper worker. It is inherent, its inherent overproduction leads to imperialism and wars abroad, and through advertising a war on the minds of the home population, whose humanity is reduced to greed. The growth imperative destroys the planet, the concentration of wealth in few hands leads to the subversion of democracy by dark money to prevent regulation and fair taxation. One further element in the nature of capitalism, especially relevant today, its utter ferocity towards any alternatives to capitalism. Think of Margaret Thatcher's mantra, there is no alternative. Whether it is a labor organizer like Joe Hill, or Iran's Mossadegh, or Guatemala's Arbenz, Cuba's Castro, or Venezuela's Chavez, or Maurice Bishop in Little Grenada, coups and assassinations are the weapon, weapons of choice. It's much easier to declare that socialism is a failure if all the resources of the most powerful country in the world are focused on guaranteeing its failure. It's essential to start with capitalism because socialist and utopian ideas arose directly in response to the horrors of capitalism. In general, I would say that socialism is best understood as a critique of capitalism and an exploration, not always successful, of potential alternatives. Through unions fostering a sense of human solidarity, socialists have fought to gain some control over the production process and a greater share of the wealth they create. They have fought for free public education, for universal suffrage, health care, social security, and generally have opposed imperialist wars. At the same time, there are obvious reasons why socialism is a dirty word to so many people who have heard about the nightmare alternatives devised by Lenin and Stalin and Mao. Claims to put the majority of workers in charge of society easily have led to vanguardism of the tiny elite who have the correct strategy, which can only be implemented by massive force and the de facto exclusion of the majority from participating in uh, decision making. To take only the example of Lenin, he argued, passage 14, quote, the proletariat needs state power, the centralized organization, organization of force, the organization of violence. By educating 
the Workers' Party. Marxism educates the vanguard of the proletariat, capable of being the teacher, guide, and leader, end quote. He is full of praise for Marx's account of the radical democracy of the Paris Commune, quote, here we observe democracy introduced as fully and consistently as is generally thinkable, is transformed from capitalist democracy into proletarian democracy, end quote. But for, for Lenin, the key concept for realizing this transformation is, quote, the dictatorship of the proletariat. Quote, a Marxist is one who extends the ex acceptance of class struggle to the acceptance of the dictatorship of the proletariat, end quote. His conception of this dictatorship became clear as soon as the Bolsheviks, after a 10 to 12 decision by their inner circle, succeeded in seizing power. Lenin immediately shut down opposition newspapers. Only a short while later, Lenin instituted the Cheka, which he called the sword of the revolution against class enemies, with the goal of circumventing any just judicial procedures. This is the origin of Putin's NKVD, and was responsible for thousands of murders. Stalin, to be sure, carried Lenin's dictatorial murders vastly further, but Lenin set the pattern, all in the name of socialism. To return to the emergence of socialist ideas as a response to and critique of capitalism's own horrors, Robert Owen, 1771-1858, is a good example of the whole group of early 19th century so-called utopian socialists reacting critically to the evils of capital, capitalism they saw with their own eyes. Having earned a lot of money, Owen became in charge of a cotton factory in Manchester with 500 workers under him. There he is. Uh, passage 15, quote, He was soon struck by the terrible discrepancy between the great attention given to dead machinery and the neglect and disregard of the living machinery, namely the workers. Owen was obsessed with the necessity of transforming authoritarian education of children. He fought for the eight-hour day, for unions, and in 1813 he published A New View of Society, explaining the principles behind his socialist philosophy. That is, that's one of the earliest uses of the word, socialism. He tried to set up utopian communities in England and in the United States, but they failed. However, most modern discussions of socialism derive from uh, or are reacting against the work of Karl Marx, 1818 to 1883, claimed as the inspiration for the worst as well as the best manifestations of socialism. Nice beard. <laughs> here, here, too, I would say that Marx is best understood as a critic of capitalism. Though he alluded at various points to possible alternatives, urged workers to unite, and so forth, he was very wary of offering any sort of blueprints, or as he called them, recipes for the cook shops of the future, end quote. At age 25, he writes, passage 16, quote, we do not attempt dogmatically to prefigure the future, but want to find the new world only through criticism of the old. I am speaking of a ruthless criticism of everything existing, end quote. Marx's single most influential work undoubtedly is the Communist Manifesto. The most famous, famous part of that text from, from which most of the quotable quotes are taken is the opening section, primarily a critique of capitalism which closely echoes the points I have tried to extract from Adam Smith's texts, but where Smith simply acknowledges the soul-destroying stupidity of capitalism's impact on the great majority of humanity Marx sees oppression and calls for resistance, for the destruction of capitalism. Unquestionably, though, Marx's greatest work is Capital, Volume 1, and had two subtitles, quote, a critique of political economy, end quote, by which he meant criticism of economists whom he considered apologists for capitalism, and, quote, Volume 1, the process of capitalist production, end quote. Of all the many volumes in his collected works, this is one of the very few that he personally edited and saw through publication. Famous exploratory works like the Economic and Philosophic Manuscripts of 1844 and the German Ideology and the Grundrisse were only published in the 1920s and 30s. One piece of Marx's analysis is worth comparing with Smith's. For centuries, Marx argued, a craftsman, whether a slave or free, produced a commodity, C, Let's say shoes. The commodity is sold for money, M, 
which is then spent to purchase another commodity, let's say clothing. This gives us the formula C to M to C, a process that could be repeated ad infinitum. Shoes? Anyone recognize this? <laughs> Sell for money and buys clothing. What is specific to capitalism, Marx argued, was that the transaction starts with money, M, and only purchases a commodity in the expectation of increasing money, so M to, one to, M to C to M enhanced. Passage 17, I won't read it, uh, to the question, where does lots of money in search of making more money come from, Marx answered with what he called primitive accumulation. It was great fun, and I urge you to read the passage, but I won't take the time, on the myth of primitive accumulation based on celebrating the diligent, intelligent, and above all, frugal elite versus the lazy rascals, <laughs> meaning he loves those. Uh -huh. Against this myth, he argued, quote, in actual history, it is the notorious fact that conquest, enslavement, robbery, murder, in short, force, play the greatest part, end quote. Much of the rest of Capital Volume 1 is devoted to spelling out the process by which peasants and tenant farmers were driven off the land and agriculture was transformed into capitalist agriculture. But brutal conquest was not forgotten, passage 19, quote, the discovery of gold and silver in America, the extirpation, enslavement, and entombment of mines of the indigenous population of that continent the beginning of the conquest and plunder of India, and the conversion of Africa into a preserve for the commercial hunting of black skins are all things which characterize the dawn of the era of capitalist production." End quote. <coughs> but for most Americans over 30, it was unquestionably the Cold War that fixed the most negative perception of anything suggestive of socialism and confounded it with Soviet communism. <coughs> Uh, this is about the Cold War, there's no doubt that the fervor of the confrontation of ideas contributed strongly to Cold War bipolarity. The predominant ideology in the United States, emphasizing markets, mobility, mutability, was universalist and teleological. From the very beginning, communism, the special form of socialism developed in the Soviet Union, was created as the antithesis of the capitalist ideology uh, that the United States represented, an alternative future, so to say, that people everywhere could obtain for themselves. The key claim of Cold War U.S. ideological struggle was the equation of free markets with democracy. Milton Friedman, a major architect of U.S. neoliberalism, who actually published a book entitled Capitalism and Freedom, wrote, uh, passage 21, the free market is the only mechanism that has ever been discovered for achieving participatory democracy, end quote. Yet F.A. Hayek, the theorist Friedman was celebrating, passage 22, designed constitutions for the dictator Salazar in Portugal and the dictator Pinochet in Chile as proof, he told Salazar, against the abuses of democracy, end quote. It is at least worth raising the question, in what sense capitalist markets are free? On this, I will fall back on Fernand Brodel, who probably knew more about markets than anyone since Marx, passage 23. The motion of the self-regulating market seems to be the product of almost <coughs> theological taste for definition. This market in which the only elements are demand and the cost of supply and prices, which result from a reciprocal agreement, is a figment of the imagination. Perhaps the most obvious way in which the free markets are not free is the emergence of monopolies. Quote, today the typical economic unit in the capitalist world is not the small firm producing a negligible fraction of homogeneous output for an anonymous market, but a large scale enterprise producing significant share of the output of an industry or even several industries, and able to control its prices, the volume of its production, and the types and amounts of its investments." End quote. A further questioning of the idealization of democratic free market comes from French economist Thomas Piketty. His basic explanation of the historical origin of income inequality is that income from investments already in the 18th century, now in the stock market, over the long term is much higher than income from salaries, 
even for the highly skilled. Check, check out the passage, I won't read it. Given that about half of Americans don't have savings of $500, free access to investment income is not an option. The key guru of anti-socialists, though, is F.A. Hayek, whose 18, 1944, The Road to Serfdom, spelled out the inevitably nightmarish consequences of any sort of socialism. In his preface to the 1976 edition, he offers two versions of socialism still relevant to contemporary debates. Quote, at the time I wrote, socialism meant unambiguously the nationalization of the means of production and the central economic planning which this made possible and necessary. But Sweden, Sweden is commonly regarded as much more socialist than Austria. This is due to the fact that socialism has come to mean chiefly the extensive redistribution of incomes through taxation and the institutions of the welfare state, end quote. I would argue in conclusion that only the second version is relevant today. No one, certainly not Bernie Sanders or any of the so-called squad of new young congresswomen is arguing for the Stalinist version of socialism, nationalization of all the means of production. On the contrary, it is the right wing that is trying to dismantle legitimate state services in education, transportation, housing, and elections. My own personal wish for a socialist transformation of society is along the lines of the presentation we had a few weeks ago from the Cincinnati Union of Cooperative Initiative, namely worker-owned and worker-managed businesses. But as I said at the outset, my focus here is on potential canvassers responding to the Cold War-inspired accusations of socialism by Trump and his echoes. My own radical <laughs> answer to the charge of socialism in the upcoming election is to ignore the term socialism and to invoke the discourse of rights. Mm -hmm. Bernie Sanders' greatest contribution to American to political debates is to insist that health care is a right, something now echoed by virtually every Democratic candidate. Rights have the great virtue of permitting one to offer a patriotic and even a religious pat uh, patent, namely the Declaration of Independence. Quote, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We, now, we know we have to fight for rights, but what really speaks to the welfare state version of socialism acknowledged by Hayek is the expansion of the discourse of rights. Why not a right to decent housing? a right to a good education, a right of women to control over their own bodies, a right to paid family leave, a right of workers to organize without persecution by employers, a right to fair elections free of outside money or foreign interference, a right to decent security when we are too old to work. That's it. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I have a question, Peter. Peter, thank you for that very erudite presentation. I consider myself a uh, theoretical socialist, <laughs> theoretical, because I haven't seen socialism work as well as New Deal capitalism, industrial capitalism here in America. I haven't seen it work that well. We created a middle class bigger than all the other classes. I haven't seen that happen any, anywhere else. So I'd like you to, oh, and I define socialism as public ownership of the major <clears throat> means of production and distribution. Uh, as opposed to private ownership, that's kind of how I define it. Help me with a couple terms. Uh, could you distinguish industrial capitalism from finance capitalism? Is that something you're interested in? And also, I'd like you to help me define communism, which I think is like a subset of socialism. Could you do those, Peter, please? How long you got? Yeah. <laughs> I got about an hour. <laughs> no, no, I mean, it, it, what you echoed as a definition of socialism is precisely the traditional one that Hayek sees as essentially the case, and it certainly is what ha has happened in various degrees in places that have tried to establish uh, socialism. Uh, as far as the so industrial, I mean, I think if you look at the history of the United States, um, you have this enormous expansion of industry, productivity, and so forth. And now you have capitalists trying to find other places in the world to invest their money. They're not investing in expanding 
the productive base of the United States. They're finding places in Bangladesh and all sorts of other places. So part of the transition from industrial to financial is simply the fact that the capitalist class has moved from a primary emphasis on expanding uh, production to finding ways of in profitably investing their capital. Maybe that's too, too simple. But uh, again, I, I think communism, I think it's useful to think of communism as the socialist, I mean, the, uh, the uh, uh, Russian imperial version of it. Uh, but it's true that, I mean, Cuba, I taught a course on Cuba for 10 years. Cuba certainly ended up t taking over all sorts of uh, production. It, it has made, uh, in spite of all the arguments against it, it has made a serious attempt to have worker input and worker uh, degrees of worker control. I always use show films of Cuba. They, they show factory workers interacting and making suggestions and trying to change things. But again, under the pressure from the United States trying to destroy it, uh, it became much more authoritarian and, and far less democratic. Yeah. Yeah. To me, the main difference <coughs> between communism and socialism is that communists had wanted to control everything, the whole means of production. They, they would, we, we would control Duke Energy. It would belong to, to us. Um, <coughs> While I might like that, um, socialists are not usually, I, I, well, they're, not, they're not wanting to take over all the cap the production of the country and run it as public operations. Socialists you have not wanted that. But I just, <coughs> we're all socialists if this means respecting the human rights of, of all people. We, we are socialists. And so it shouldn't be a bad word. I mean, everybody would want it. Every, all working people would want it if we were to establish it. They would not want to go back to a, where they were just pawns and many people couldn't live, could barely live. They died in the streets without homes. We don't want to go back to that. So, I mean, if Bernie Sanders uses, I don't know if he does still use the term socialism. I mean, so social what? Yeah. I'm he, sorry? He says he's a social democrat. Yes, okay, social democrat. I mean, I'm a de I guess I'm a democratic socialist. I go to the meetings of the DSA, Democratic at times, Democratic Socialist of America, and there's a women's group that I like a lot there that I don't get to go to very often. They meet at night, and I can't really get there. But um, democratic socialism, maybe that's the term we, we should use. I mean, if we you know, are for human rights for all people. Now, not that it's not complicated to, to ever establish such a thing. Of course it is. But don't be I don't think we should be afraid of the term democratic socialism. Um, I, don't, I think we shouldn't get too stuck on terminology. It's more uh, values we need to be expressing. And, be ex and we need to express our values very strongly. And if they turn out to be socialism, that's what they are. But that terminology itself can, yes, it polarizes and it can interfere with preconceived notions and brainwashing that's been done. But your presentation reminded me of that in a capitalist-driven society, uh, it is in their interest to keep, you, uh, to keep people uneducated. Um, and when I say uneducated, I mean calling education the ability to pass tests and to get scores reduces real the real purpose of education, which is teaching people to think, to question, to be curious. None of that comes from a test. And 
This movement to privatize public education, Thank you, Sue. I think, is based on the self-interest of the capitalist who benefit from an uneducated society. Peter, um, I just wanted, I want you to talk about three things, if you would, and, and along the lines of uneducated, um, I rem I'm reminded that one of the keys to the capitalist uh, demonization of communism was always to label it not just as communism, but godless communism. Right? So the, the role of religion and, and a kind of religious mentality when, when um, what was his name, uh, Brodel, talked about an almost theological something or another. And so that's one thing I, I wanted you to mention. Another thing was, I seem to remember in a history course I had when I was in high school, that before it was life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, it was almost life, liberty, and property, right? And, and, um, and that was very much part of the core of the American mentality at that time. And then finally, if you would mention the role of competition. Um, because that's, that's something that uh, we seem to prize as a sort of instinctive human necessity somehow, and what's, what's the role within socialism for that? Yeah, yeah I, I, uh, I wince when you mention competition because it's an issue I, I should have tried to deal with. Um, I was sort of locked into Adam Smith who presents uh, this relatively benign, the, uh, the passage I have on there on the uh, invisible hand, never raises the question of that, and, and sort of, in fact, uh, the end of that passage sort of says uh, that it, all these interactions are advantageous to both sides, which is sort of the antithesis of hardcore uh, thing. But where I would really have put it is in talking about the origins of monopoly. Because one of the, the ironies or dishonesties of capitalism is to talk about the free market implying lots and lots of competition, but nobody hates competition as much as a capitalist. They're constantly buying up any, any uh, little business that seems to offer some interesting new thing uh, or you know crushing it in various ways with uh, price fixing, so that the small new uh, business uh, just can't possibly compete. So it is a crucial aspect of competition. Now, I mean, I ha I'm unaware of any uh, elaborate discussion of socialism, but the very idea of socialism, and even more so the word communism, implies a sense of community, a sense of working for society, of being part of a collectivity uh, where the interests of the group are foremost. And I'd like to just come back to the point I was trying to make about worker-owned businesses and worker-run businesses. I went to the two-day symposium that they organized here in Cincinnati uh, by this, and, and what was very moving to me was a long speech by a Mexican electrician's worker for a very long struggle they had against uh, privatization. Uh, the uh, the uh, president tried to crush uh, worker con any kind of worker control or input, and eventually, in a two after a two-year struggle, they actually got physical ownership of a number of the facilities, and they work out through that process of joint ownership, of working together, cooperating, thinking about what's in the best interest of our immediate, our immediate <coughs> firm, but also more generally how how our firm fits into a general notion of a good society. I think what we lack is precisely process of sharing responsibility that is not simply tied to individual personal profit. Is there, is there, I get all your questions. I, can, I, I should have written them down. Well, do, do you have any thoughts about the theological or religious oh, right. relationship yeah, yeah. to capitalism? Yeah, well, that was one reason, sort of cynically, as a rhetorician, I was saying, the, uh, citing the, de the uh, Declaration of Independence and, uh, and say, created by God, I'm personally an atheist, um, but I also think, I just finished reading a very valuable book, I think, uh, White Working Class by uh, Joan Williams, 
And she points out, I mean, you know, how this two-thirds of the population who don't have college degrees, who have suffered from the sort of dazzling statistics, 42,000 factories have closed in the last 10 years. Six million manufacturing jobs have been lost. This is a category of people. I mean, she initially defines it as people who are above the poverty line, but uh, below 100,000, something like that, cut off point. These are people who have really uh, suffered a lot, and um, they resent elites making fun of their religion. You know, um, Obama talked about their cling, cling to their guns and religion and so forth. And I, I think one of her best arguments is that we, we need a whole lot more empathy. She points out that we, we feel there's no hope. We constantly hear you can't change any of these Trump people. But she points out that honesty and empathy have led to a majority of Americans accepting gay marriage. Or, you know, uh, and that, that's, that's an amazing, I, I, I really think it's an amazing thing to contemplate what sorts of changes, I mean, the, the fact that we have a, a, su a pretty successful um, presidential candidate who is openly gay, I mean, I, I don't really expect me to get elected, but you haven't had, a, a, apart from Spence, <laughs> vicious of gay bashing as part of the discourse. And, and I think that's really important to think about that kind of change. That Not publicly. Hmm? Not, yet. <laughs> not yet. Not publicly and not yet. Yeah, yeah. but again, I, I think the idea of stressing sympathy for the pressures on this, again, two-thirds two of the population uh, who have, have suffered from globalization and who value family traditions, including religion. I mean, I going too long, but I, I just love watching Ken Burns' um, History of Country Music, because you have on the one hand the Carter family who offer, uh, and their, their gospel songs, a version of life is intolerable. I mean, one of their songs says, just a few more hours of sadness, just a few more days of pain, before we get to join Mama in heaven. Uh, and, and you know, and there's there's one that I, I love. <laughs> I mean, it's just it's so it's so happy. It says, um, "I'm gonna take that old gospel ship riding through the arm of the sky. I'm gonna dance and sing until those bells are ring as I'm leaving this world behind." I mean, I think it's important again if you think of empathy to understand the degree to which religious consolation is, as, as Marx said, uh, he, says, he started this wonderful early passage where he talks, he says, we don't want to take the chains off people and, and not even leave them the flowers that are wrapped around the chains. Um, that we need much more empathy for why this is a crucial consolation that people feel under terrible pressure. Discussion of Adam Smith, but you didn't mention the fact that Adam Smith said that critical that there be regulation, government regulation. You know, you know, the passage where he denounces government that's critical. regulation. That's critical. That's critical. He denounces government regulation. Well, he he also, he also, no, no, but Adam Smith said it was important to have regulation because you could not allow uh, the free enterprise to go unregulated. That's my understanding of Adam Smith. Okay, well, I'll be sure. Uh, regardless of what they said or not, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, well, as a friend of mine said, uh, every increase in democracy is an increase in regulation because most regulations are defending the majority against the machinations of, of, of a money to leave. But that's where socialism comes in. Where you can you can counteract that. Explain. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, I mean, again, I, I you know I went to Martha mentioned the Democratic Socialists. The first meeting of players I, I went to, they put up a, a statement on the screen about what socialism is, and I said, you know, you need to add the word and emphasize democratic socialism. And this kid says, oh well, socialism has always implied democracy. 
uh, I, it's not if you're over 30, if you lived no. through the Cold War, you were barraged by the, you know, the invasion of the body snatchers. I mean, all sorts of horrible things were going to happen to you if the communists uh, take over. And you can't trust your neighbors, or you have the Hollywood 10, all sorts of repression involved in that deepening fear of socialism. That's why I said this is why my, my strategy in this is uh, to be hypocritical, or, and, but I, I think I we can never it. win the argument in favor of the word socialism in the context of the 2020 election. Unless we abandon the term, I think it's a dead end to try to defend the term. What about moral capitalism? Could we have that? And it sounds like an oxymoron, but what's wrong with it? I never heard of it, but if you want to explain it to me, I'd love to hear it. Well, there's a mic, right? FBI is. Moral capitalism would be, you know, where people say, all right, we live in a society, we live in a community, we live among other people, and, you know, the fruits of capitalism, you know, you know, have a basis at every level of society. You know, that just because you don't travel on that road doesn't mean it shouldn't be paved. You know, just because you don't turn that faucet doesn't mean that it shouldn't operate for somebody else. I mean, I was born in a world that had, you know, indoor plumbing and electricity and roads and schools and all those things, and I didn't pay for any of them. They were just there when I got there. No, you paid taxes. But somebody paid taxes before me. You didn't. You didn't pay taxes. Not when I was born. Not immediately. Not until I started working. But since then, I've been paying taxes to support the, con you know, the continuum. You know, so, you know, why should we say, okay, well, the factory closes. Uh, these people will get unemployment and, you know, they'll find their way, you know, to somewhere. You know, as a society, we need to be concerned about these people who, you know, go from, you know, the factory to the Walmart greeter. Uh, you know, we need to say, all right, you know, capitalism, you know, has this creative destruction to it. Um, you know, nobody said, you know, to all those people who raised horses and mules and, you know, did all of those things with, with you know, with those animals that, you know, from 1900 to 1925, you know, in 25 years, most of those people would not have a living anymore because, you know, automobiles and trucks, you know, took their place. You know, it happened. And those people got other work. You know, and it's time for us to step up and say, okay, your factory closed. Now it's time for us to decide how you can still be productive in our society. That's what moral capitalism is. We take some of our profit and we turn it into moral capital, not just dollars. What's the pressure to do that? There is no pressure yet, but there should be. Yeah, if we demand it. I would say that the vast things that you cite are a result of... I would say the vast majority of positive things in our society, like public education, uh, social security and so forth are precisely a consequence of unions. I mean, FDR, by, by passing a, a law which encouraged union organizing, that's what really brought a middle class out of, out of the depression. And the capitalists consistently, I and mean, if you read through union corporations at Winkler, they're consistently been against pack, ta taxation. Uh, it's not an accident that the biggest, <laughs> Trump is boasting about the biggest tax thing in years, and, and it's overwhelmingly to benefit, to benefit the, the capitalists. Um, but again, I, would, I, I think, this is why I mentioned the you know, worker-owned businesses. I think there's a whole different dynamic if people who are engaged in production actually have some sort of control over the process and the goals involved in it. That seems to be where you have at least a possibility of moral socialism. Yeah. No new taxes and no old taxes either. <laughs> okay, we're getting there. How about uh, public ownership of the Federal Reserve? <clears throat> Rather than being owned by banks who meet secretly and make decisions to support banks. How about that? Well, I think 
question. Well, uh, you you have a you have an understanding of the Federal Reserve that I really I really can't even argue with. I'm not sure. I mean, you brought this up in several past meetings, and I'm not really quite sure how you see that functioning or what public control of the Federal Reserve would amount to. But I, I mean, the FDR did some of that. He basically built the infrastructure in the country using some federal reserve money. It's basically using it for Main Street rather than Wall Street. It's really not rocket science, it's politics. Peter, thank you so much for your presentation. We really appreciate it.